and you could see a quarter of a million people all lighting candles and lights and the whole field lit up right. it was like jyoti the jyoti right everywhere was light and we i was playing with tim harden it wasn't the heavy music that i was used to playing but i knew how to play the folk music and he was very jazzy so the first day was the folk music but what it really was is the first day was swami Sachidananda, richie havens arlo guthrie uh joan baez and tim harden and ravi shankar so the first day was the calming music it was the music that centered everybody to mm. be ready for the next two days of ruckus and loud rock and roll and booming and partying right. but we took we took that initial crowd and centered it with this really beautiful music protest music beautiful music raga music you know and 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 and, and it was calming music and in the people you the people could feel that and so that set the tone and peace vibration for the rest of the festival. Now, when I was in back of the stage and I'm hearing Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of my podcast. Uh, we have a very special guest today joining all the way from Michigan. We have Mr. Muruka Booker. Hi. Namaste. How are you all? Namaste. Uh, I'm good. How about you, Muruga? I I am fantastic. <laughs> should I call you Muruga or should I call you Steve? <laughs> <laughs> you can call me anything you like. <laughs> yeah. Most, so most people know me by Muruga. Right. Right. I think we need to later talk about the, about that name. Uh, so how's the situation right now? Uh, over there, Muruga, with the COVID and pandemic and everything? Well, you know, my uh, wife's niece is on the front line in Oakland Hospital. She even administered the first vaccine, um, in a sense. Right. She says it's on and up. But she also says that it seems that many people don't even know that they have it right which proves that the uh the the virus is getting weaker right because many people don't even know that they have it right, right. but it's on an upswing so we're in a two-week lockdown they're trying to say no clubs and restaurants for two weeks right <laughs> So how uh, when did you last perform uh, anywhere? Like because be, because of the pandemic, a lot of places are closed now. So what, when was your last performance, uh, live performance? You know, it was uh, the Woodstock to be remembered in Detroit, uh, 50th anniversary. Right. Was the first uh, was the last big one that we did. And then because we did that, we had a lot of publicity. We were going to play a lot. Right. Uh, and right after that, <clears throat> I had a knee operation. So then after I got healed from the knee, the COVID came in. Right. So it was uh, la last, um, uh, last fall what was the last one though i had a party in my backyard with 50 people we kept the distance and we played <laughs> live on the porch wow See, you can't a still mind has no fear right 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 and and if you're safe if you're safe then you could be peaceful right right but if if you feel safe here then you're you you don't really worry right <laughs> You don't worry because if the mind is still, there's no thought to worry with. Right, right, right. <laughs> Stillness, yeah. it's yoga. You, right. you know, uh, it's becoming aware of your mind. And when you become aware of the mind and the thoughts and you don't feed it 
uh, tea, you know, like entertain it. Right. Then the mind subsides. But it's very important to know that we're not the mind. We're the perceiver. Right. We're, we're the transcendental being that is perceiving. Right. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> what I what I also believe is that uh, what you uh, perceive or your perception of the world, what you put out is what you see, right? So if you put out a peaceful thoughts, you will see peaceful environment, right? So exactly right. Everything is energy and consciousness, and and we have free will to direct the consciousness, positive or negative, peaceful or violent. Right. And the choice is ours. We have God's free will. Right. <clears throat> so, uh, Muruga can. Ananda told me it. what. Go ahead. Uh, no, I was just uh, saying, so can you tell me a little bit about where you live right now? Uh, I know you live in Michigan, but can you tell me about your city or town? I'm in Ann Arbor. It's about 45 miles out of Detroit. And uh, if you look at Detroit, Detroit would be uh, right around here, you know, on you see. And yeah. I'm just up 40 miles, just like this. Right. Here. It's a college town. And it's very quaint, very nice. It's uh, very creative, uh, uh, very free. Uh, it was the first, among the first cities in the country that in the 1960s to, to smoke ganja was a $5 fine. Right. <laughs> and that was in the 60s. So everybody used to come to Ann Arbor and smoke the ganja on the street. They get a $5 fine, and that's like paying $5 to go to the nightclub. Right. <laughs> right. It's, it's a bigger fine to be drunk on the street than to have a smoking on the street. Right. <laughs> the smoking in public is a $50 fine today. Drinking in public on the street, being drunk on the street, is a hundred and fifty dollar fine. Right. Right. <laughs> so it shows you that Ann Arbor is very progressive. Yes. Right. Right. So overall, overall, normally the Michigan area state is quite progressive, right? Yeah, it's considered to be, uh, you know, Middle America. But guess what? We we have uh, medical marijuana legal and recreation marijuana legal. Bon right. chung car. <laughs> so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so Muruga. So uh, I'm uh, I'm a Sri Lankan. I, I I was born in Sri Lanka. So I came to the Philippines 15 years ago. Um, so. Have you come across Sri Lanka? Have you been to Sri Lanka? I, I thought you, you've been to Sri Lanka already. No, but my guru, Swami Sachidananda, is from Sri Lanka. Right. Right? right. And I know that Muruga is one of the big deities there with Ganesh and Shiva. Yes, it's actually uh, supposed to be brother of uh, Ganesha also, right? Muruga is the war uh, god of war. Right, weaponry and war, right? <laughs> yeah, also Muruga brings the light to humanity. Right. And that's the war, darkness and light. Right. The war is not a war like this. It's the war of the self. Right, right. Well, yeah, so Muruga, yeah. Muruga drives a peacock and the peacock has the feathers. So the peacock stands for sound. He throws a spear at the dragon. The spear, okay, no, the feathers is light. Mm. His, the peacock feather stands for light. So Muruga drives on the light vehicle. The spear is the sound. When you throw it, it goes whoosh. So that spear stands for the word, Om, or Nara Brahma. The sound, 
the dragon is our lower mind with the ego. Right. So when the light and the sound pierce the mind, the mind realizes the source. And the mind realizes that, that the ego is not the boss, but the reflection of the source. That's what Gayatri Mantra is. Oh, oh, Gayatri, illumine my mind and intellect to know that you are the divine deity of me. There's nothing outside of yourself. You're not praying to get some God outside of yourself. Mm. Muruga is your own higher consciousness. The consciousness of light and not a Brahma. Not a yoga. Mm. The sound yoga. So, the consciousness that knows the cosmic vibration illumines the body, mind, and intellect. Our own body, mind, and intellect. We are not being saved from nobody. We are being saved from ourselves. Right. From our own darkness and our own ignorance. Right. <laughs> right, right. So, it all <laughs> must lead to you. You are beautiful. You are divine. You are the incarnation of the transcendental source that is not only consciousness, cosmic consciousness, but it is beyond cosmic consciousness. It's the ground of being that the consciousness exists in. Right. <clears throat> so beyond consciousness. Right. So so we we people tend to think that uh, you and me are two deep, two separate things but uh, when you when you consider the cosmic of things the overall thing so you and me are not two separate things it's we are part of the same same consciousness right <laughs> precisely exactly 100% right and the same consciousness is talking to itself over there right <laughs> We're not a personal body. We're a cosmic body. Right. We are personal. So I have my personal thing. I'm Maruga. You know, you are you. They are they. Everybody is themselves. But my fit thumb, the thumb, is part of the hand. The hand is part of the arm. The arm is part of the body and the head and the feet. So the foot doesn't say... I am the foot, and you can go and do your own thing. I don't care what you do, because I'm the foot. I'm doing my thing. No. The foot, the body, the arms, the hand, the consciousness, the mind, all must work together and to go in the same direction harmoniously. Right. So, likewise, we are all the cells of the one body of existence. And that consciousness is the same that comes through you, through me. Right. But it, when it comes through your vessel and my vessel, it's like having uh, water is clear, but one water has red ink and the other water has blue ink. We are not the ink, we're the water. <laughs> right. And you take the ink away, the red and the blue, is the pure, clear water of oneness. So I'm a, a Serbian ink, and you're an a Indian ink, and a French ink, and a, a, a Jewish ink, and Italian ink. That's just the dye. But the source that, that each one of us is, is the one same source. Right. <laughs> you you talk about, you know, red, red ink and blue ink, blue, uh, blue ink, uh, which gets me into like, you know, you, US is right, right now going on this election uh, situation where everyone is divided. Uh, what's, yes. your th what's your thought on this, this, what is going on with the election? <laughs> My thought is, is that I am on no side. Right. My thought is I am transcendental to the two sides, observing how both of them act. Right. You see, 
it's like two children. The one child, he steals the peanuts. The other child says, I'm going to steal your Pepsi. And they're stealing each other's stuff back and forth. Right. And they're mad at each other like children in a, in, in a park playing games. And so if you're transcendental and you're not the red or the blue, but you are transcendental clear and you know that you're not the ink, you're not either sides. Then you could observe the truth and see how both sides are acting. Right. Right. But if I take a side, then I'm going to be judged by how I'm acting. So when we transcend sides, now we should have both sides. I wrote a song, hey, you donkeys and elephants too, green party, everything in between. We're all American. You know what I mean? Yeah. What I'm saying, we need to have the two parties to keep it in check. And the failure of the two parties is that each party is calling the other side the enemy because we don't believe what they're saying. Right. The minute we call each other the enemy, we no longer have a country. Yeah. <clears throat> so then you're going to have what happened to the Bolsheviks in Russia and to the to to the uh, to the uh, uh, the kings of Russia got taken over and they make it the communist. You see. Right. And right. Boom. This has happened many times. We must not in America think that we are the strongest nation in the world, that we are the biggest, because then that is getting too cocky. And when you get cocky in a soccer game, if I'm winning and I get cocky, then I'm not observing and I could lose. Right. So you don't want to be cocky. You want to be humble. And each side should just say, what is the best thing to do for the country on the whole. And you see, like Justin and I, we put a group together. He puts in some music, I put in some music. We add some and subtract some and we end up with something nice. We worked on the album cover together. He mm -hmm. did a background, I straightened something out. He straightened that out. He said, I don't like this. I said, I don't like that. I like this, I like that. And we work together. And then we have a product together. So I see that the politicians in America don't know how to have civil obedience and talk with each other on a high conscious, spiritual, intellectual level. All they know how to do is impeach. How they ought to know, do is to say, your side's no good, that side's no good, and they don't talk about what is the good that we could do. I'm not interested in who's good and who's bad. Mm. I'm good too, and I'm also bad. Right. I'm not interested in that. I want to know what is the positive thing to do. What can you and I do to benefit the world? Right. So, so I'm not going to go say, oh, you're a Hindu, I'm a Christian. Oh, you're a this, I'm a that. No, we're saying, hey, what does your path have to offer that we can learn from. And here's my path. Here's what I could offer. Let's see if we could take the best and leave the rest. Right. So it's uh, so I think the main thing that is missing is uh, honest dialogue, right, between the two or between these different views, and Precisely. it needs to be discussed yes. and come to a com come to a compromise where they can. The, what are the things they can agree rather than focusing on things that they disagree, right? So, Yes, because real truth, the truth is larger than our, what we want. Right. Right. Right? So yeah. we have to agree on the truth. You know, the truth is, if I don't take care of the water and channel it properly, I'm going to uh, get dirty water like they have in Lansing right now, or Flint. Right. So now the whole city can't drink the water. Why? Money. Greed. <clears throat> yeah. You see? 
<laughs> so muruga you you talk about uh, i wanted to ask you about so uh, i got to know you because of justin bridges because uh, i i got i got connected with justin uh, uh, through his a plus community and all this so we have bunch of friends and amico uh, yes and amico uh, so that's how i got to know you that from justin so when did you meet justin uh, first uh, how did that friendship uh, started I think it was the last year or the year before. Uh, I have a friend who has a dispensary over here, and um, it's uh, OZ uh, Dispensary. And uh, our friend Daryl uh, runs the dispensary, and he has a, a beautiful home. And Justin was at his house making a video for his Mad Dabber. Uh, Diamonds are uh, a Dabber's best friend. So then they invited me over to be in the video. Right. And then I had my not a drum with me and Justin and I happened to just do a jam together. And we saw that it it meshed, it went together beautifully. We we really took off and the music really went somewhere. And so we said we have to play together and do some recording together. Then he came over to my studio. This is my studio here, see? Right. Wow. Right. And uh, here, I'll uh, take you through it. You can see it a little bit. This is the studio. Drums. The green screen. See, there's the room there. Right. And then this is the engineering room. That that mural is so cool. Who did that mural? I did it. Wow. Here, see. Oh wow, nice. Such a Dananda, not a Brahmananda. John Lennon, I, I painted that the night he got shot. Right. See, there Muktananda, uh, Nityananda, Baba Ramdas, Timothy Leary. <laughs> I studied with a lot of the different gurus. Right. I want to thank India. I want to thank India. Because India helped enlighten uh, much of America through Swami Sachidananda, through Vivekananda, through Yogananda. And these teachings of Kriya Yoga, Nada Yoga, the teachings of transcendence. Right. How to how to know all the dimensions of what is. Right. And they brought that to us in 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 uh I, I so I am grateful to the masters of India who came here. They came here, they gave my wife and I the Gayatri Mantra, the sacred thread. Uh, we got initiated as, as Goswamis. Uh, you know, I actually received the title of Nada Yogi Paramahamsa Goswami. Right. You know, I went through all of these things as a celibate monk, uh, living uh, celibate for two years. You don't speak unless you're spoken to. Meditation seven hours a day. Introspection. Right. You don't get peaceful until you know your true self beyond your mind and body and beyond the field of perception. You have the OM comes and rings loud inside in meditation and the light fills you. The Jyoti fills you. The Jyoti is not just at the end of an arti. The Jyoti is the inner uncreated light in the brains, the electric synapsis. It's the very light, the very light in us. Mm. You see? And that jyoti is the electric synapses of the brain, the life force, electric energy that makes the body move. So we need to know this higher dimension. It's like having a car and not knowing who's driving it. Mm. And not knowing that it takes gasoline and that you have to have a battery. You just get in the car, turn the key, start driving, and you don't know nothing. But when it runs out of gas, you don't know it needs gas. You don't know that it needs a battery when the battery runs out. 
because you're ignorant to the car, your vehicle. Well, our body is also a vehicle. Right. The body is like the car. It's a vehicle. Someone is driving it. It has a subconscious consciousness that is making the heart beat and the body digest food and shit and piss. Right. You see? <clears throat> but then it also has a conscious thing that says, oh, I'm going to call Maruga up in Ann Arbor, see how he's doing. Right. Right? So, yeah. So wh one thing that I realized, uh, so prior to the co prior to the pandemic, uh, prior to the COVID happening, a uh, lot of people, including myself, were just uh, just going in autopilot, uh, just going through the days, weeks and months, just going to work, come home, going to work, come home, just doing those, you know, just the cycle of everything. It's like in autopilot. And then, uh, then the pandemic hit where your cycle was like kind of disrupted. Now you, you have time and space to look into yourself. So that's where I actually... I got in, I got involved doing meditation. I did the 21 day meditation like three times now, three or four times now, and then uh, start, yes. started doing the yoga. I never thought that I would do actually because you know considering like I'm a heavy metal you know a guy you know supposed yes. to be like a badass guy. Uh, so I never thought that I would actually actually enjoy doing yoga. But I'm now doing it for several months. I really enjoy doing it. Uh, and I, as you said, I, I can see, I, 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 I get to understand now about myself, which I didn't know a couple of months ago. Yes, yes. And it makes you even a better ass. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't make you a wimp. You're not a sissy. You get to be a better ass. <laughs> you yeah. know yourself. Right, right. right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Muruga, I play with, you know, I, I, I jammed with Teddy Nugent. I jammed one night with Hendrix. You know, I play heavy metal. I was doing heavy metal when they didn't have a name for it. Right. <laughs> I was playing rock and roll in 1967. Yeah. So so going back to that, can we talk about a little bit about your childhood, uh, you know, back in the day when you were growing up, how did you get into music, uh, Muruga? Yes. I am Serbian Orthodox. I was raised Serbian Orthodox. It's from Yugoslavia, you know, Serbia. Right. My father plays accordion. And in the Serbian music, we have the kolo. It's the circle dance. Right. Right? It's actually a trance, a trance dance. So when I was three years old in the kitchen, of my house. My father would have accordion with rhinestones and it said Bukvich, and they would play the Serbian Kolo. And I would dance in the kitchen with my mother at the age of three. There was no bigger joy than to dance with my beloved mother while my father was playing the circle dance right. with rhinestones on his accordion. It was like a psychedelic trip. I saw the accordion. Oh, 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 daddy, what's that? Oh, that's the rhinestones. It spells our name, you see. And at three, I knew I wanted to be a musician. In the same week, my mother put a pencil in my hand and showed me how to draw a stick figure. And I said, no, mama, people are not like sticks. They look like this. And I tried to draw a real figure. So from the age of three, I've been doing painting and music, right. art and music, right? And at the age of, by, by the time I was five and six, I knew that I only wanted four things in life. I wanted to have a wife. I wanted to know God. I wanted to play music mm -hmm. and I wanted to draw and paint and do art. And I knew that that's what I wanted from then. And my mind was fixed. It was set. I only had three or four regular jobs in my life because I knew that that's not what I wanted. 
and I went for what I wanted, not for what I thought that they want they wanted me to do. Right. I went after what I wanted to do. And I went for the music, I went for the art, and I went for God, and I went for a wife, and I married for 40 years to my beloved Shakti Ma. Wow. I'm playing music, I have my own studio. And I do my artwork. I was gonna quit the music to realize God and become a sannyasi. And Satchidananda says, oh, no, you can't do that. He says, the closest you get to God is playing music because God is the creative power. Mm. And when you create, God is coming through you. So if you want to be connected to God, play music, do art, and be creative. Even if you're a cook and you're a creative cook, even if you're a garbage man, but you're a creative garbage man, you see, then that's God coming through you. Mm. Right. Stay creative and let the divine creative power work through you. People are so wonderful. We are so lucky to just be alive and to be a person. And, but we don't look at everything that we got. We are like people, like a little boy or a little girl who has a millionaire father who put a million dollars in the kid's bank account for when they grow up. And the kid doesn't know that they got the million dollars. So they don't have no money, they think, to go buy some pop and ice cream. Yet, the father has put a million dollars in their bank account. They just don't know their own wealth. Right. So each one of us are like this, with a great, beautiful wealth of knowledge that's beyond religion. It's the very nature of you. And like Trump Rinpoche says, he says, be aware of what is. And I said, you mean of even the moon? In the rocks falling off the mountain on the moon? He said, no, no. Be aware of what is with you, all dimensions of who you are. <clears throat> the whole existence in this is a circle of perception. This is a circle. Mm. I can see around like this. So all of life I see in a circle that's this big. And in that perception is the outer world. Peel it away. The body. Peel it away. Go subtler. The mind. Peel it away. Light frequency. Peel it away. Sound frequency. Get in back of that. Consciousness, get in back of that beingness. Mm -hmm. Then get in back of your being that is totally empty. It's void of light. It's void of sound consciousness. It's vo void of the world, void of everything. But there is a life force in back of it that is sustaining it. That sustaining life force is God. It's the potential. It's the uncreated. It's the intuitive in intuition. That before there was a heavy metal song, there was raw energy. Then I tap into my energy, and then all of a sudden, I'm playing heavy metal music. Why? Because I tapped into the uncreated energies. Mm -hmm. I tapped into my intuition, and I made a song up. All of the hits were made up. Right. Your microphone, somebody thought of it. My iPad, your iPad, your telephone, somebody thought of it. So everything is a thought manifested through action. Right. <clears throat> and we can make that action go positive or negative. Right. <clears throat> So, so Muruga, so uh, you started, uh, you, you mentioned about your, your father playing the accordion and I, I believe you also started uh, playing accordion. When did you get into drumming? When, when, were, when were you first uh, 
he got introduced to a drum. Well, I heard the drums all around me all the time and even on the radio, but mm. I started accordion lessons with my dad's teacher, who was Misha Bishkov, a Russian Jewish gypsy from Russia in Hamtramck at the Warsaw Music Store. And at six, I started taking accordion lessons from the age of six to 14. Right. Now at 14, I started seeing signs on the car, bumper stickers, accordion players go to hell. That's like <laughs> harmonium, harmonium players go to hell. Right. <laughs> right. And I, and I started, and then accordion players go to jail. And I started thinking, geez, I play accordion, and they don't like accordion. Right. This is America. And I'm hearing John Lee Hooker and Bo Diddley, and I'm hearing Jimmy Reed and Howlin' Wolf, and I'm hearing Little Richard, and I says, this is the music I got to get into. And right. I never could understand the improvisation fully on an accordion. So one day in school, I was in the seventh grade, maybe, I said, I'm not going to do anything until I figure out what's the new instrument I'm going to play. So for two weeks, all I did is ask the question, what do I want to play? And I'd be thinking, dar, 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 dar. oh, guitar. Ah, that's a lot of strings. You got to go like this. Then I'm saying, uh, oh, sing, love me tender, love me true. Uh, I don't have a good voice. I don't like that. Nah, you know. <laughs> and then I was at the record hop, and I was dancing. And I felt the towel. I felt the beat. I felt the rhythm. Mm. And I says, hey, everywhere my hands go when I dance is where the drummer goes when he plays a beat. And then I saw my friend Jim McCarty who played with the Detroit Wheels. Before he played with the Detroit Wheels on guitar, he was a drummer in a group called the Demonaires, a wedding right. band. And I saw him do a drum solo. And then I went to the Light Guard Armory, and I saw the, a group called the Low Rocks, L-O-W-R-O-C-K-S. And they were playing, and there was 3,000 screaming children at the band, and they were in tuxedos, punked out with waterfall haircuts and shiny shoes, playing rock and roll, punked out. And I says, I want to do that. Well, I said to my dad, I want to play the drums, no longer accordion. He says, if you bring a drum inside the house, you and your mother are both getting kicked out. <laughs> So one day I was visiting with my parents at a friend's house who had a bicycle with a siren on it and a speedometer. And I says, I wonder how the siren sounds at 30 miles an hour. So I was going around the block with the siren and the bike. And my dad says, stop, stop that. It's noisy. Stop it. And, and I wouldn't stop. And he tried to catch me. And right. he ran after me and he couldn't catch me. But I had to bring the bike back. And I brought the bike back. He says, walk home. And I had to walk home two miles. Then he came to the ho house. He came, to, he says, come with me. And he took my accordion. And he went into the alley. And he took the accordion and he threw it on the ground. And he stepped on it and crushed it into a million pieces. And I looked at him and I says, thank you, Papa. Because I don't want to play that no more. Right. I want to play drums. You play a drum and you and your mother are going out. Now, here's the real clincher. My father wanted to play accordion, but he wasn't the best accordion player. But he was like, uh, you know, uh, uh, pretty good, but not the best. And that's because when he was little, he saw the accordion players in Yugoslavia in his mother's nightclub play accordion. And he wanted the accordion. And she said, no, they get high and drink and smoke marijuana. You can't play the accordion. So she made him become a shoemaker. Mm. And he presented that all his life. And when he grew up, he got an accordion. Okay, now, my teacher who 
the accordion teacher, was also a drummer. And he used to teach Gene Krupa, who played with Benny Goodman, the drums. Right. So Misha goes to my father and says, Milos, Melvin, do you like your mother? And he says, I can't stand the bitch. <laughs> and he says, why? She didn't let me play the accordion. And he says, aha, and you won't let your son play the drums. He's going to say, I can't stand the bastard. Right. I, my dad went and bought a set of drumsticks and a practice pad. And he brought it home. And I came from school that day. And I knocked on the door. It was locked. And I could see through the screen door that there was a drumsticks and a pad on the table. And my dad opened the door and he says, okay, I got you the drumsticks. Go ahead, play the damn drums if you want to. And I bought you a set of damn drums too, but I was gonna give them to you for Christmas. Or do you want them now? I says, later with Christmas, I want them now. <laughs> and I got the drums and they were an old set of drums and I painted them green and I paint, the skins were dirty old and I painted them white. Then I took lessons for six months and I went to the big boy to get a hamburger. And I'm eating the hamburger and my buddy comes in and says, you know the Low Rocks? This is the band that was playing months ago, right? That I said all the girls were screaming and I said, I wanna do that. Right. That same band was playing a party 10 blocks away from the restaurant, Big Boys. He said, let's go and raid the party. And we'll go to the party with the Low Rocks. I said, that's where I'm going. So we went to the house. We knocked on the door and the door flew open. And the drummer <laughs> from the Low Rocks ran out of the door saying, screw you all, I quit the band. Oh. And I walked down the steps and the guitar player says, is there a drummer in the house? I said, here I am. And the guy left the, left the party and he left his drums there. So I played the drums. And he, they said to me, you're in the band. Wow. Then we went and we made a record. And we got a hit in five states with our record, a pumped out version of Fats Domino's Blueberry Hill. And we did it real fast, punk style, and we called it Blueberry Jam. This is in 59, we recorded it. And it became a hit in 60 and 61. It was a hit in five states. And I was playing for 5,000 people at a time, opposite Ronnie Hawkins and the Hawks, who later became the band opposite Anne Margaret, Frogman Hendry, opposite the Supremes. We bet, you know, uh, and my career was launched in, at the age of 16. Wow. Now, at the age of 16, on my fourth lesson with Misha, I played a gig with Misha at a Russian communist banquet. He says, they're all communists, but you all know it. They'll get you drunk and pay you good. <laughs> so I went and I played my first gig on my fourth lesson. Right. And the Russians got me drunk as hell and they made me do a drum solo. And then my, I, I never quit since then. I got turned on. It was such a Jones. The music was so infectious. It was like taking heroin or something. I couldn't stop playing the music and I'm 77 and I still can't stop. <clears throat> right. So Muruga, can you tell me a little bit about the Detroit uh, music scene back then? Because I, I heard this uh, also from Ted Nugent before in his interviews, he talked about the scene. But can you tell me a little bit about Detroit scene back then? Well, there was a lot of blues. John Lee Hooker was living in Detroit. People were creating garage studios, recording studios. Right. So before Motown, it was Tamala Records, and they were recording in a garage. Motown was a converted house. 
you see? Mm. And there was other studios like Pac-3 that was a converted garage. And these little studios created some of the biggest hits in the world. And there was a lot, a lot of nightclubs in Detroit. Right. I could go play and jam at 10 nightclubs in one night and not even hit the scene at all. And I did do that, you, you see? So it was a bit great music scene. Uh, it was a mixture of all kinds of people from all faiths and all nationalities were here in Detroit. And that music was going on. Well, even when I was five years old, I remember the music on the radio. And it was, uh, you know, uh, the McGuire sisters and Benny Goodman and all of that music. It was very infectious. And there was uh, places like the Latin Quarter in Detroit, Panchito was playing there in his Latin orchestra. He used to play with Stan Kenton, you know. So there was the blues, rhythm and blues, and rock and roll. All of that was just churning in Detroit, and people were jamming. I remember I did a concert. I was playing concerts when you didn't even know who uh, 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 Ted Nugent was. You didn't even know who Alice Cooper was. You didn't know... Uh, Billy Lee played in my band, and he became Mitch Ryder. Mm. We were all like buddies, all hanging, and it became like a, a artist music community, very infectious. A lot of garage bands, a lot of soul bands, a lot of uh, uh, funk and blues groups. You know, we were hearing James Brown, and the white kids were slowing James Brown down and making it a little bit more slow and funky. So we would take doo 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 bop, chicka chicka doo bop, and go boom boom bop, chicka doo doo bop. Way back in the fifties and sixties, mm -hmm. and that's the fatback beat that they use in hip hop. That hip hop beat ain't new. That's fatback music from the fifties and sixties from the right. Chitlin circuit, right? Right. Right. So it was, in Motown, then became very big when when the riots came in sixty seven. And Motown went to California, the whole music scene dropped. And it was very difficult for it to come back. And when it dropped, disco came in. Right. But see, disco was a real good thing. See, when I started playing drums, they wanted to make a commercial. So they took my bass drum out and they upped the bass. You know, the voice, doom, doom, da, do, da, doom, da, doom. And, and they made the vocals and the bass and the guitar loud and the drums softer mm. in the back. That was too primitive. And we got really angry about that. We said, well, where's my drum sound? That ain't punked out. I want my drums. When disco came in, they brought the sound of the drums back, even though it wasn't live. They brought the awareness of how beautiful the drum is when you put it up in front. Uh oh, battery. You there? Yeah. Hello? Okay. <laughs> I had to re plug in. My battery was getting yeah. low, so I plugged in. <clears throat> so. So the disco brought that back, and then the DJ start rapping over that beat, and you get rap. Right. You, 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 you see? And it, it brought over a whole new music. So it's all good. It's all great. But it all comes from blues, and blues comes from Africa, and humanity comes from Africa and migrated out. So right, it's all right. juju music. It's all juju. Right. It's all the juju. It's the blues. Everything is the blues. Just... Um, uh, put in a different kind of way. Yeah. So, uh, Muruga, I want to talk about, uh, so uh, I'm really proud that I'm talking to you. I'm glad that I'm talking to you because you're, you're one of the musicians that actually played on the first Woodstock Festival, right? Yes, yes. 
So, can you tell me yes. how how did you get that opportunity to play in Woodstock? And uh, also, I want to ask you about that atmosphere at the festival because it's it sounds very amazing. And it was. It changed my life. See, Woodstock. I was playing with Paul Winter in the Winter Consort right. on A and M Records. They were they were trying to mix classical and jazz and a little bit of rock and roll and it wasn't hitting the scene that was really going on at the time. Hendrix and all of the heavy metal and everything. Right. And I wanted to I wanted to relate. So I quit Paul Winter, which was a real something really big to do because I was making six hundred and fifty a week in, in sixty uh eight to nine in seventy. I was making six fifty a week playing with Paul Winter but I quit and I quit a week before Woodstock, right? Maybe two weeks or a week or two before Woodstock. Right. I used to play with a folk group in 64, five, six, and seven, Jim and Jean on Verb Forecast. They were a singing duo. We did folk rock. In 64, we were doing folk rock, 65 and four. Okay. So, I went to visit Jeannie and she said, let's go to the Cafe of Go Go on Bleecker Street in the village in New York. So we went to the Cafe of Go Go and there was playing a group and Jeremy Steig, the great jazz flute player, and Tim Harden was playing in the jam. And so I started drumming. And I drummed and backed up Tim Harden. Mm. And then we took a break and Tim Harden packed up his guitar and walked out. I said, shit, that's Tim Harden. You know, uh, I'm going to go talk to him. So I followed him and I had two joints in my pocket. And we're walking down the street. I says, hey, Tim. He says, yeah. All right. I said, you want a joint? He says, yeah. So we start, started smoking a joint walking down the street. And he says, I really like your playing. If you're in Woodstock, give me a call. Maybe we could do something together. So I saw that was the opportunity. Right. And I told the white lie. I said, I didn't want him to think I was too excited. Right. I wanted to negotiate. Right. So I said, hey. I'm going to be, by chance, I'm going to be in Woodstock tomorrow in the morning, and I could call you in the afternoon. He says, okay, call me. So the next day, I went and drove to Woodstock and got there by the afternoon. I says, I'm done with my meeting. He says, come and see me. So I came. He's sitting in his cabin, nude, eating watermelon that had DMT in it. <laughs> and he was spaced out like hell. So I sat down and ate the watermelon with him. And he says, hey, I'm doing a little gig next weekend. Would you like to do it? It's going to be at Jaeger's Farm. We're going to do it at the farm over there. All of the hippies, no one wants to hire us. So because we, you know, we're too psychedelic, too far out. We smoke weed, take LSD. No one wants to hire us. You know, they didn't want to hire Jimi Hendrix. All that. We were all freaks, you see. It was still so new. Right. So he says, we're going to play our own festival. I said, okay. So I stayed there for a week. And I rehearsed with him, with his band. And then first three days we rehearsed. And then he disappeared for two days. But we kept on rehearsing. And then he comes back in two days. He was pretty much a stoner, and he went out and partied and everything, and then comes back with right. a bunch of clothes. And he says, here, these are all the outfits. There's clothes. Pick some clothes out you can wear for the gig. So we all picked some clothes up. I had an Indian shirt and Indian pants that I took. You can see it in the picture of me at Woodstock. Right. And, right. and then uh, it was time to go to Woodstock, and we got in the car, and we – 
we're in Woodstock. We're practicing in Woodstock, and the farm is just outside of Woodstock. And we got in a car, and there was 10 miles of cars. So all day, we're in the car in the line. And people are coming outside of the restaurants, bringing food to us, selling things from the window. We, I remember Melanie was in front of me, right? Mm -hmm. So we finally got pretty close, and we got up to the Holiday Inn. And so then we're sitting in the field at the Holiday Inn next to Swami Satchidananda and his disciples. Now, strangely enough, this is far out. Satchidananda was the disciple of Swami Shivananda. You know Swami Shivananda? You ever hear of him? Yeah, yeah. He's the medical doctor, the Swami, the Dr. Swami. Right. And he, so in 1964, I got stranded in New Mexico and I met a sannyasi disciple of Shivananda who initiated me in 64. In 67, I met the Maharishi and I started doing transcendental meditation. And I was doing rounding where I was doing three hours a day. And in that rounding, the Nada Brahma filled my head, the Jyoti lights filled my head and it imploded. <laughs> and I went beyond consciousness to the ground of being. <clears throat> but I didn't know what happened to me. I didn't know the word Samadhi or Nirvana. I didn't know what it was. I just knew that I had a profound experience where I realized that I was nothing. So this experience was with me. And when I'm at Woodstock, I see the Swami and we're sitting in the field and I start playing my hand drums. And I said, I'm gonna play my hand drums and I'll know if he's a saint, if he's a realized soul, if he could tell through my drumming that I'm yearning to know God. So I'm playing, and all of a sudden, the helicopter came and took him away. Right. I said, well, I guess that's not it. So then five minutes later, the helicopter comes and takes me and Tim away and drops us off in the backstage. And now we're in the field backstage, and there's the Swami right there in the field. Right. And he says to his disciples, there's the guy that plays the drums like the tablas, like the Indian drums with his fingers. And he's going, doo -doo -doo -doo. I says, you don't have to show him, I'll play for you. And I sat there and I started playing my drums. And I closed my eyes and I went into trance. And all of a sudden, the spirit spoke to me and said, why are you wasting his, your time playing the drums when you want to ask him something? So I finished playing and I stopped and I looked at him. And just when I looked at him, the fence went down and all the people went over the fence. Thousands of people over mm. the fence. You could picture the energy. The whole field of Woodstock just got packed within a minute, right? Mm. And I looked at him and I said, sir, what is life? He says, life is this. God gave you free will. You have God's free will. You are energy. See those people? And he's pointing to the people going across the, the field, just all, thousands of people going over the fence. They were like the ants in Africa that you see that they cover the whole hill. He says, see all of those people? I said, yes. He says, they're energy. And you could see it right there. You could see the energy. You see? I says, yeah. He says, and your energy. And that energy came to see this energy play. And it's going to see you play on stage. And with your free will, you could direct all of those people, positive or negative, and the choice is yours. Which do you want? I said, Swamiji, I want positive. 
And then just then, I saw they were going to take a picture of Tim Harden and J Richie Havens. So I got up real quick, ran 20 feet, and got in back of Tim Harden and smiled. And the guy went, click. And that picture ended up to be the center picture, the center fold of Woodstock to be remembered. Right. And I start walking away, and the Swami says, hey, what's your name? And I says, Steve Booker. He goes, oh, Book Booker. He says, Booker, come and see me in New York. So we played that night. It was fantastic. It was dusk. It was getting dark. And you could see a quarter of a million people all lighting candles and lights. And the whole field lit up. Right. It was like Jyoti, the Jyoti, right? Everywhere was light. And we, I was playing with Tim Harden. It wasn't the heavy music that I was used to playing, but I knew how to play the folk music, and he was very jazzy. So the first day was the folk music. But what it really was is the first day was Swami Satchidananda, Richie Havens, Arlo Guthrie, uh, Joan Baez, and Tim Harden, and Ravi Shankar. So the first day was the calming music. It was the music that centered everybody to mm. be ready for the next two days of ruckus and loud rock and roll and booming and partying. Right. But we took, we took that initial crowd and centered it with this really beautiful music, protest music, beautiful music, raga music, you know, and, 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 and it was calming music. And, and the, peop you, the people could feel that. And so that set the tone and peace vibration for the rest of the festival. Now, when I was in back of the stage and I'm hearing the other bands play, I looked up at the sky and I said, God, we're just poor people. We're poor hippie musicians. We don't have any money, we just have our talent. And look, and we're protesting against the war in Vietnam. And look what you did for us poor people. You made a million people, almost a million people come here in the name of peace, in the name of love, in the name of music. God, you are a powerful God. And that changed my life because there I realized I am an energy field that God has, is that power of energy and that you could be a nobody and nothing, just a small hippie trying to play your protest music. But if you're doing the truth and what's meaningful to you, the people will come, the people will listen and they will gather. And God made it possible for that Woodstock festival to happen the way it is because they couldn't make it happen after that the way it was. Right. You see, it was, it was, it was the, the power of, of uh, higher consciousness, of peace and of love that came together so powerful. And so this gave me faith that I could go and hitch my wagon to a star, that I could go and become somebody in something, that I could have a voice and that we could be heard and to have faith in that. You have a voice. You are someone. You're not just some unknown or this or that. I'm speaking to everybody out there. You are a great entity of life that has the full potential to do great things within you and tap into your own inner nature, to your inner self, to your inner power, to your inner consciousness, to the ground of your own being, to your own light, and spread that light because light becomes more infectious than the virus. Right. So I tell them, I'm starting a jamdemic. Right. <clears throat> a, a, once you start jamming, you get the you 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 get the virus. You can't stop. 
the music virus, the right. peace virus, right. right? The creative virus, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> talking about this, your experience in Woodstock, it it it's uh, it's giving me you know a lot of excitement uh, actually because I seen these pictures. Is a lot of these black and black and white pictures on the magazines, and you were right. They were try. They they did try to do that festival again, but it was not successful like that, right? Because it maybe because yeah, it, there was not not the same purpose. Right, right. <clears throat> uh, the purpose. Yeah, Muruga, I want to show you something. Um, yeah, you know, you know this guy, right? <laughs> Teddy Nugent, he's my bro. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, can you tell me a little bit about uh, meeting him? And I think you you also recorded with uh, with him, right? Well, I did do some uh, uh, recording sessions that weren't put out. Right. Uh, we did some super sessions together, but I jammed with him a lot in the sixties. Right. You know, tell you the truth, a lot of people have an angst against Teddy Nugent. But the guy is really a great soul. Yes. He's really a good person. Yes, he hunts and he kills the animals, but he eats the animals he kills. And he uses every part of that animal, just like the Native Americans do. Right. He's straight. He doesn't take any drugs. He doesn't drink. Uh, he lives in nature. Yeah, and and he does but, he does he does a lot to, to conserve the environment as well, right? He has a lot of things that he's tied to. Bong <laughs> Shankar. <laughs> yes, he does, and a lot of people should not put him down. They shouldn't be mad at him. You know what? Whether he likes Trump or not, it doesn't mm. matter. Right. The guy, the guy is a, a wonderful musician, a wonderful person energy and a, he's an old guy like me and, and you know i'll tell you if you want to jam with us come on we'll go for a two-hour jam and see if you can keep up we're high intensity that's what we used to do an hour jam high intensity right Not right stop, ferocious right he's got that i saw teddy nugent fly off the balcony on a rope into the audience, over the audience, onto the stage, grab his guitar, and, and hit the high note, right? <laughs> and he, he came from the audience of a balcony of a theater. Right. And he took the rope all the way down. He's a wild man, right? He's out of the box. Right. He's a great soul, a great person. I just, uh, last, uh, the last, last summer, we just, we had a uh, uh, lunch together. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are just, uh, I think a lot of people kind of hating him just because of his political views, not because of he, who he is, right? Just, just... Uh, exactly, and I say, forget, forget that crap. You know, the, you're letting bullshits get in your way. Right. You see, political view. What's the political view going to do? So what? <laughs> so what? Look at they're all crooks. Right. Did you see? You know, they're everybody. We made ISIS. We made the Taliban. Yeah. <laughs> right. 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 <clears throat> yeah. Um. Uh, yeah, Muruga, you, I, I, I believe you, you had the pleasure of uh, working with the great poet Allen Ginsberg, right? Yes, I did. That was wonderful. Allen Ginsberg and Bob Dylan. What was that experience like? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, it was, it's all very elevating and conscious. I was hanging out at the Integral Yoga Institute in New York, right? Mm. And um, a friend of mine knew Allen Ginsberg and knew that they were doing a recording session. He says, Maruga, Allen Ginsberg is recording. You should go there. But, <laughs> well, Perry, uh, 
I, I met them through my friend and we did free time TV first one night. Mm. So Perry Robinson, me, Ellen Ginsberg, and about 12 of the big poets and uh, a few of the musicians uh, uh, that he had did the free time TV. Well, they mentioned, well, we're going to record tomorrow. So my friend says, I'll tell you about it. So the next day I was eating lunch at the Integral Yoga Institute and my friend says, hey, they're at the uh, record plant right now recording. You should go down there. So I went, I, I had my drums uh, in my van and I went down there and they said, well, bring them in and set your drums up. And I went in there and I went to Allen Ginsberg's boyfriend. He was setting up the Buddha mm. and the incense. And I said, hey, would you like a joint? He says, if you ask me that question again, I'll kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> I said, look at man. I like my shit too much to give it away to someone that wants to kick my ass. I'll just smoke it myself. <laughs> <laughs> so right. then I started playing the drum. I started playing the drums and, and it was this folk rock beat and it was real nice. Dylan was playing guitar and in the intro, it was sort of pretty. So I had bells and I played the bells. And now Alan Ginsberg's not a professional musician, but you know, he has the heart, right? You know, he's, he's got the, the fervor. So he says to me, don't use those belts. And Dylan says, Alan, I like the bells. Let the boy play the bells. <laughs> so I played the bells, right? right? And we played. Now, I must tell you that Bob Dylan is one of the best rhythm guitar players I ever heard or played with. Right. He has impeccable towel, impeccable time, impeccable. And he gave me his number, but then he moved and his record company was mad at him because he was doing things with Ginsburg and he wasn't doing his own albums. That's when he had that motorcycle accident. Right. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> so, uh, Muruga, you were part of the... But, but Ginsburg, Ginsburg yeah. was hanging around with Trump or Rinpoche. And Trump or Rinpoche was also my guru. Right, right. So in, in, in so the... Second, was the yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. No, what I was saying in so the... So it was... Yeah, let, uh, you go ahead. <laughs> so hanging around Ginsburg and hanging around Baba Ram Dass and, and uh, Trump or Rinpoche and Muktananda at that time, it was a very high conscious... A uh, time of evolution and evolving in my own consciousness. Hmm. So, uh, be together with that and, and meeting such a Dananda and meditation, it changed my life forever. Right, right. So, how long you've been? Uh, so, you've been you've been a yogi for so many years now, right? <laughs> I'm 77. I was doing yoga since 64. Wow, right. <clears throat> um what why do you think Shankar. yes so why why do you think yoga is important uh, for people well because they get to know all of the dimensions of their own facility of their body mind and soul and person and energy fields mm. and because because yoga uh, shows you that inner space and outer space is one space. And that there is no other. There's only oneness. Right. See, when I think it's you and it's me, then I'm trying to get something out of you. You're trying to get something out of me. Uh, I'm living my life and I'm going to get all of it that I can because I'm going to die. I'm going to croak. So I might as well have as much sex, as much drugs, as much drink, as much good time, as much party, as much this, as much church, as much that, as much business, as much uh, all of this here as I can before I die, because I only got this chance to do it. Right. So we're trying to fulfill ourselves, and it's empty fulfilling. So in yoga, we no longer 
are trying to fulfill ourselves with external things. We see that already we are fulfilled just in our own true nature. Right. So yoga, hatha yoga, leads, it stretches the body. See, if I tell you to sit and close your eyes, you're going to sit and then you go. Oh. Right, oh. right. Oh. 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 And so I'm jittery, I'm shake, I'm not comfortable, I'm in pain, I, I'm tense, I'm uptight. Hatha yoga takes that away. So Hatha yoga makes the body healthy. Hatha yoga makes the body supple. It takes the tension away. And that tension goes away, and then I could sit straight. Right. Now that I could sit, now that I could sit, half the yoga, the physical yoga, leads to pranayama. Pranayama is the yoga of breath. Kumbhaka, breath retention. Mm. My yoga teacher retained one breath for 35 minutes while playing the tablas with no blinking of eyes. Wow. So now you can see that we're, uh, see, just sit here and look at me and just don't blink. You blinked, you see. Just sit and not blinking. Mm. You blink. Now you're getting it. See, when you become conscious and you let go, ah, you're blinking again. Yeah. You see? <laughs> right? Right. So, so we get this control, right? Right. So Hatha Yoga goes to relaxing the body to sit. Pranayama stills the mind. Japa stills the mind further. Pranayama brings the energy up into the brain. It equalizes your breathing. You learn how to do kumbhaka, which is breath retention. To retain the breath, taking a breath in. See, exhale for a minute, all the way to the stomach. Now inhale, fill the stomach. Fill the middle chest and fill the top chest, but not completely. Now retain the breath, but let go of the chest muscles while you retain the breath. Let go of the stomach muscles while retaining the breath. And retain it as long as you can, and then let it slowly out the nose. And then do it one more time. Close your eyes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can you feel that? Yeah. You retain the breath and you let go of the chest and stomach muscles. And that's how you practice that. You can get it longer and longer. Right, right, right. Can you feel, <clears throat> what did that make you feel like when you did that? Um, I don't know. I mean, I feel like I mean. Kind of, I mean, in control, or that sort of a feeling? Control and relaxed. You're right, right. Right? See, and as you do that, it's going to bring oxygen to the brain, and you're going to feel very blissful. Yeah, but, but letting, go of, letting go of the muscle while retaining the breath is, is it's challenging, right? Because we are so used to just, just because those yeah. things we see as, as the same thing, right? But it's it's uh yeah, see I'm I'm exhaling. Now inhale.
<laughs> See, so I'm, I'm retaining it. See, it slowed me down so much yeah. that you go from your alpha, theta, beta waves. You learn to go to the slowest wave. You know, alpha, beta, delta, you go to the slowest wave. Right. And through breath control, you slow the wave down. Right? Right. Right. <laughs> it's not necessary to retain it for 35 minutes. I'm just saying that I do this breath retention as an exercise. And that's very important to do even in the time of COVID. Right. And now with the COVID, people need to take a lot of vitamin C because they get very nervous and they get agitated and very tense. And that's very bad for the adrenal glands and it creates a high blood pressure. Right, right. So <clears throat> by doing this breath retention and breathing, by taking a lot of vitamin C, we're releasing the tension of the body so we get a good blood pressure. And the adrenal glands get neutralized, neutralized, and, and we're um, be much healthier. And I also do intermittent fasting. I eat in a seven hour period. Right. It's not a matter of what you eat, but to eat in a seven hour period. See, it takes 12 hours to burn the sugar. Then you go into fat burn. In the fat burn, in the fat is where all of the bad cells that can turn into cancer that the body wants to eliminate is stored. Mm. And if we don't get out of sugar burn into fat burn, we're not burning the bad cells of the body out of our system and eliminating it, and that turns into illness. Right. So you want to have a three to five hour period of fat burning, not just to lose weight, but to burn the bad cells, the body waste out of the fat, out of the body. So you need to go into fat burn. Most people go for 12 hours and after 12 hours they eat again and they're still in the 12 hour thing and they never go to fat burn. So therefore they get unhealthy and the immune system gets sick. Mm. But doing this, you can consider sleeping as eight hours of fasting. So don't eat four hours before you go to, uh, five hours before you sleep and four hours after you get up. So then you have seven hours during the day to eat. And then the rest, you're burning the sugar and the fat. But while you're fasting, you could have water, you could have regular tea with no sugar or black coffee with no cream and sugar. And I suggest to also switch to Celtic sea salt, which has less sodium and 60 trace minerals. Mm. So in your fat burn part, you take a pinch of the Celtic sea salt and you're giving yourself 60 trace minerals to vitalize yourself during this year fast period of time. Right. You're going to be much healthier. Uh, my heart, I had a thing that wasn't connecting one mm. of the, one of the uh, 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 nerves. And within a year of this year, um, uh, intermittent fasting, it cured me. Right. 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 So simple things like that. It's good to be a star. It's good to try to be rich. It's good to try to achieve. It's good to try to be the best you could be. But if you're not healthy, you're not going to experience it well. You want to be healthy to experience your success. Yes. <laughs> With uh, talking about success, you you were part of uh, Muruga. You were part of the P, 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 P Funk All Stars, right? With George Clinton. So yes, I am. Yeah, so uh, how long you've been part of that? When did you first meet George Clinton? Well, I was playing at the chess mate way back in the time that I was playing with John Lee Hooker over there 
and they used to book us Hooker and Booker. Right. And I had my own band, which was a funk jazz rock group. And George Clinton got hired when the first time, the first week that they started the P-Funk, he was working there as a chess mate with a six-piece group. Right. So he used to come there to see me play. And then he would go to see me play at Baker's Keyboard. Then in the early 70s, I met a guy called, they call him Fat Bernie. And he was a producer with George Clinton. And, and uh, Bernie brought over uh, Bootsy and uh, uh, Fra Frankie, the drummer from the P-Funk, to my house. And then they invited me over to Pack 3 one of the small studios I talked about. And I did a session with them in 77. And then in 80, my friend was his road manager, Joey Zalabak, Jagabundu. And Joey introduced me to George. And at that time, I just got through playing with Weather Report. But I said, I got attuned to my youth. I saw this guy on TV, and he was playing guitar for six months and had a hit record. And so I said, I'm going to go buy me a guitar, and I'm going to tune to the rock and roll of my youth right. and, uh, and start playing. So I called the group the Soda Jerks, and I got my wife to play the drums, and I play guitar. And I wrote 22 songs in, in two weeks, and I showed them to Jugabundu, and Jugabundu told George Clinton, and George Clinton came to meet me, and he said, and I said, I got a group called the Soda Jerks. I'm playing guitar instead of drums. Mm. And he said, Holy shit. <laughs> Anybody that could be live like a monk, play Woodstock, play Weather Report, then give up the drums and play guitar. And, 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 and start a, 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 a new wave punk band, I'm going to hire you. I'm going to give you a record contract sight on scene. Right. <laughs> and he gave me $75,000 worth of studio time. And I lived in the studio for five years with the P-Funk at the Disc LTD. <laughs> and the whole P-Funk family was staying there. Bootsy, Bernie, the Brides of Funkenstein, uh, you know, all of the P-Funk, and they were producing me, and I would be there, and then they would say, well, why don't you play your drums on our stuff? So then I played Smell My Finger, Hydraulic Pump, Atomic Dog, and all right. of that kind of stuff. And there in the 80s, George says, Maruga, you're a lifetime P-Funk all-star. Right. And then he made my site, and he put it up, and he put me there as a P-Funk All-Star. And I played a lot of gigs with him in California. But I lived with him in the studio for five years. And I became his yoga masseuse. Right. And because he was taking a lot of coke then. So, 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 so was uh, 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 Sly. Sly Stone was there, too, and Bernie. So, you know, they were taking a lot of coke. I tried it to see what it's like. And I saw that it sped the heart up. So they wanted me to show them yoga. And some guy was teaching them fast pranayana breathing, rasta you know. And mm. I said, don't do that. You're on coke. You don't want to speed up your breath like that. You right. want to go slow, deep breathing to slow your system down. Right. And I showed them how to do hatha yoga. And I massaged them. I was his masseuse for over 10 years while I was playing with them and help to keep the, the uh, swelling and, and, and uh, uh, his, his uh, tension out of the body. And finally he realized that the sodium in the free base was causing him to uh, 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 get inflamed and swell and, and almost like elephantitis. So then he quit the free base and he came back to normal, but he had to get a pacemaker. Mm. But he's normal now, and he's not taking all of that stuff. He just has a little bit of ganja here and there. Right. <laughs> so, you know, I was showing those guys yoga and all of that. You know, Atomic Dog, 
that came out, you know, I told him, you know, such a Dananda said that dog backwards is God. Right. <laughs> D-O-G, G-O-D. <laughs> right, the next right. thing I know, atomic dog is out. <laughs> <laughs> right. <clears throat> Uh, Muruga, one of my favorite bands is uh, one of my band bands is uh, Grateful Dead. Uh, you know, so I know you you had a session with Jerry Garcia also, right? Yes, there he is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, actually, he played with me. I didn't play with him. Right. I, I influenced I influenced the album Blues from the Rainforest. I chased Merle for two years to do it. Right. And at first he still didn't. And then I went out and I did a series of new age um, cassette tapes. I'll show you, see? They're there, you see them? Right. Can you see, uh, wait, yeah, there yeah, they yeah. are. Yeah, yeah, I can see Right. That. Right. Okay, so in the 90s, I was doing shamanic, uh, shamanic drum music in the new age field. So then I brought that to Merle Saunders and I said, look it, I have the distributors, Back Roads, Music Design, New Leaf, and I sold 35,000 units out of my living room. Let's do an album. I'll be the earth, the drums, and you be the sky, the synthesizer, and let's do something for the rainforest. Then, we recorded it, but Jerry wasn't on it yet. Mm. And Jerry comes and says, hey, what new projects do you have? And so our music was pretty spaced out. So Merle says, well, I got this funk stuff. He says, well, we did that. What else? He says, well, I got this soul singer girl. He says, but we did that. He says, well, I got this blues project. He says, but you and I do that. What's new? Mm. He says, well, I got this very weird project with this weird guy, Maruga. You know, and in those days, I was wearing orange robes and shit, right? <laughs> right. It's a new paradigm. Uh, that's another story. But so he said, let me hear it. And he heard it. And he says, I want to play on that. And right. that was the whole, that was our tracks for Blues from the Rainforest. So he played on that. And then that became a hit, 275 units, uh, 1,000 units sold, and they made $3 million. Wow. The rest is history. But see, they still get, not Jerry, but, you know, Merle at the time, you know, when he saw Jerry wanted it, he made me sign off and only give me 1%. Whoa. And then I had to sue him to get the 1%. So you see... Unless we're enlightened, even musicians who are trying to do good for the world are still screwing each other. Right. And we got to get to the point of where we're stopping screwing each other. That's why in my studio, we do it equal. When Justin and I record, we're equals. Everybody in the band is an equal. The right. engineer is an equal, and the studio is an equal person. So we all split it equal. Right. Now, there's, now there's no ego to fight. We're all equal. And I made it that way because I got screwed. And I didn't want anybody to get screwed like I got screwed. Right. And I says, I cannot do that to anybody. <clears throat> yeah. So learn to be equal. Right. Uh, Muruga, one thing I also note, uh, f find out is that uh, you're, a, you're actually an Orthodox priest as well, right? Yes. Yes. I'm an autonomous Orthodox priest. I got ordained through the Old Calendar Greek Church. Right. When, when did you get ordained? About 12 years ago. So uh, can you tell me a little bit about what is this? Because I don't really know the difference between Orthodox uh, church and, and a regular, maybe a Catholic church or Christian church. What, what, what's the difference? 
The Orthodox Church is the original church that stems from the apostles of Jesus. Right. It eventually split and became the Roman Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. I really believe that at the time of Constantine, a lot of people praise him. I praise him for legalizing Christianity, but I don't praise him for hijacking it. Mm. Right. See, he look, he went and destroyed a lot of the written books, the Gnostics. If you didn't believe their way, they killed you. Mm. All the Gnostic books, now they found the Nagamati, these books that are found in the jars in the desert, because they went to hide them, because they wanted the real teachings of Jesus to be learned. Now, you're from India. Do you know what is in Kashmir? No. Now, they can't prove it, but supposedly there is the tomb of Jesus in Kashmir. Right. Right? Now, there's all kinds of stories that he died on the cross, that he resurrected and came back. The disciples saw him afterwards. I believe Jesus was a regular rabbi. Mm. He was a person like you and me. I believe the word Virgin Mary means like virgin olive oil. Pure, the pure olive oil. Right. It doesn't mean no sex. It means pure. The pure consciousness, the pure Brahma, pure Shiva, pure Vishnu, pure consciousness, pure Satchidananda, pure existence, knowledge, bliss. To realize the pure state beyond the tainted body and mind, the state beyond perception to the ground of being, which mm -hmm. is where you go to be reborn. You go back in there, and then you're born back into the field, but with the higher elevated consciousness. So rebirth, to me, is like nirvana in samadhi. You know those terms? Yes. Right. So it's to realize your higher nature. And I know a lot of my Christian brothers and sisters are going to be mad at me, you know, but I'm saying that Jesus spoke in parables to people. He says, he speaks in parables and he says, I speak in parables so they don't understand completely what I say. Mm. But to the disciples, I speak the direct truth. For instance, he says, he with five loaves of bread and two fish, he felt, fed the multitudes. Okay, there's two ways of preaching in the church. One is by law, and the other is by grace. And by law is where the myth and the story and uh, all, all of the rules come in. In realization, in God realization, is where grace comes in. Right. So many people, so we go by the law until uh, we have grace then we don't need the law. Then, then all of the, um, of what you would say, um, all, all of the laws of the church and all of the, the beliefs turn into the realization of the Holy Spiritual Light. And that becomes the dogma. And the dogmas are put aside. So now, what is the five loaves of bread? What, by, by law and dogma, the five loaves is a miracle that he felt the melt, fed the multitude with five loaves of bread and two fish, and there was still some left over. Right. This is the, the myth to show that God is very powerful and can feed everybody. But when they say 
by grace, how do you teach the teaching, that same teaching by grace? The five loaves of bread become the five books from Genesis to Deuteronomy of the Jewish Torah. And the two fish is Jesus and the disciple. Right. Jesus and his apostle who's with him. So then by that way, he fed the multitudes by giving them the five books of the Torah and by being there as the high priest of Melchizedek. See, it says Jesus is the high priest under the Melchizedek. Melchizedek mm. was Abraham's teacher who showed him the altar not made by human hands. The altar that is in the heart. So St. Paul says that the body is the temple for the Holy Spirit. The body is the temple for the Shakti Kundalini. Mm. Christ is Shakti Kundalini. Christ is the Tao. The uncreated energy of life. Right. And the body is the temple that has that in it. Other people take it, oh, Christ is the guy over here. He's this guy. I got to live up to him. He died for me for my sins. No, you got to die for your own sins. You got to put your own self on a cross. You got to offer yourself to God. It's not enough that he offered himself to God. He taught you how to offer yourself to God. And you offer it by meditation, not by giving money, not by giving uh, 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 boons or by serving. Uh, going to church service, giving alms to the poor, fasting, meditation, none of it is the goal. None of it. Mm -hmm. Those are indispensable things to help you achieve the goal, which is to realize the awakening of the Christ Kundalini Shakti energy in you. The goal is to waken up your spiritual energy and to be in oneness in your spirit. Be one with everybody so that you know that I am talking to me when right. I talk to you. That's the goal. That's the early Jesus. Right. They made him into something else, <laughs> into some superhero like Caesar. Caesar was God too. Right, right. But, but if you didn't listen to his God, your ass is dead. Right. And the people that didn't listen to Constantine, they died too. You see? So the early church, the early church was not so fanatical. The early church was the Jewish synagogue who they understood the Torah and they realized they ain't so. They realized the I am, the great I am. They realized the light, the jyoti of God, mm. of course, within themselves. Right, right. <clears throat> so um yeah Muruga, this the is yeah. became scholastic the western church became law and scholastic the eastern church stayed mystical right right, <laughs> right? yeah and and they don't advertise and we don't want your money and i ain't gonna give it to you because you bought my uh uh, uh because you bought my uh uh uh, uh you know ticket ticket to my seminar Right. Right. I'm giving this to people. For 10 years, my house was, we did the liturgy, the church service for 10 years in my house. I never asked for one penny from the people. And afterwards, we gave a free meal to everybody that came. Wow. Right. That's what it's about. It's not about getting people to follow you. It's getting people to know themselves. Right. So it's so what you what you're saying, like yoga, music, and also the your the Orthodox faith and all that. It's it's everything points to you, right? Yourself. I mean. Yes. It's, yes. Yes. And if it doesn't, run fast your ass. Pick your <laughs> ass up and get the hell out of there. Right. <clears throat> so Muruga, this was so exciting to talk to you. I mean, I'm. We can do this for maybe another hour or two hours even because there's so much things to talk about. But I want to ask you, uh, 
So you are working on new music with uh, Justin Bridges. So you have a Bridges Booker and Bridges or Bridges and Booker. <laughs> it's, it's, well, so you know, yeah, it, it's Booker and Bridges and Delight. Right. And Delight. D A L I G H T. Instead of the, it's the. You know, da, that's our name. Right. So Booker and Bridges and Delight. Right. So can you tell Denver. me? Yeah. Yes. What? Can you can you tell me about the album and uh, who's 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 part of the album? Uh, who's 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 the who's playing on that album and tell me about it a little bit. 